Ricardo Hausmann, it's great to have you here uh, for the, uh, to give the inaugural lecture for the new uh, Center for Finance and Development and also to chair a, a very distinguished advisory board that we have for the Center. So very happy to have you here in, uh, in Geneva. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to see that the Center is now a reality. Uh, I've been seeing the process of its creation and I'm really excited to, that it's now here and that you are leading it. I'll do my best under, under your supervision. Um, <laughs> advice, advice. Advice, yeah, let's put it that way. Uh, there are a number of questions that I think that, that our viewers would, uh, would really enjoy hearing you, uh, hearing you answer. And uh, the first question I wanted to, to, to ask you, given your vast policy experience, but also the fact that you combine vast policy experience in a multilateral organization, and also national organizations with uh, top-flight uh, academic credentials as well. What do you think is the link between policy and academia? And what do you think that uh, an institute such as ours here in Geneva can contribute to, to policy debates worldwide? Well, um, I think uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes hit it right on the head when he said that uh, people who believe to be completely independent of thought don't realize that they're working under the dictatorship of some dead economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are usually distilling their frenzy from the scribblings of some long dead economist. Exactly, exactly. Good, good, good. I should have memorized it. So, uh, um, I, I live that uh, on a daily basis or very frequently in the sense that when I advise a government um, I'm, I'm typically fighting against uh, the framework, the mental framework mm -hmm. they have made about their own uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, and, and we're in academia and so on, the, uh, the science is about um, changing the frameworks with which we see reality because we have no direct purchase on reality. We only see reality through the mental concepts we, we develop. And, uh, and what good research does is it, it uh, enriches the frameworks with which we can interpret reality. Um, and um, so I see a, a, um, a very natural uh, co-evolution, if you want, between uh, the academic world and the policy world. First of all, our students end up in the policy world. Uh, so they get trained somewhere. Uh, second, uh, our research gets read in the policy world. It may affect the way they think about the world. Um, thirdly, um, uh, the policy world generates the sort of like the societal questions that attract the interest of academics. So, so I think that uh, the social policy world and the academic world are sort of like co-evolving in, in the same system, each one playing their own functions, but in a, in a deep interaction between the two. And um, my, my experience has been essentially a, apparently very heterogeneous because I've been mm -hmm. living life a, in different nodes of this right. network. Right. But really, I have never left the network. So it's not like I've done things that are radically different. I've done them in different places. But the substance of what I've been thinking about has been quite, uh, quite consistent over time. But do you think that this, for example, if we talk in concrete terms about a young academic, for example, who's starting out, there's always a tension between, for a young academic, for an assistant professor, yeah. uh, both in your institution yeah. and in our institution, uh, they need publications in top-ranked uh, academic journals. Uh, should this only be reserved for, for old-timers? Uh, or do you think that uh, an assistant professor also can get something out of uh, involvement with the policy world? Well, I must say that um, this tenure track uh, that we have developed uh, in, uh, at least in the US academic system, and, uh, um, I think uh, currently has the effect of slowing down scientific mm -hmm. progress uh, because uh, um, 
It's as if, uh, you know, before you can do modern painting, you have to show right. that you can do classical exactly. painting. Uh, but, you know, it's been a five-year PhD or, or so, and then a seven-year tenure track, so it's been already 13 years of research where the incentives are, are not to uh, stray too far away from, from the secure path. And I think that that has enormous uh, negative effects on on, uh, on, on, on the quality and the originality of research. So this is maybe where like interdisciplinary type institutions which combine people from, from different fields might have something to add to the way we do these things? No, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a problem more in economics than in the, in the sciences, for example. Right. And it's seen in the way, in the places where economists publish and uh, you know, they're very highly dedicated, uh, in narrow, relatively narrow journals. It, it's reflected in who cites whom. Right. But um, more, more interestingly, for example, I think that there are several revolutions that are bound to happen. The, the check is in the mail. If I were a younger economist, I would try to get on one of those uh, upcoming revolutions. Uh, but, you know, the referees of the major journals are not there yet. And represent conservatism, right? Right. So, but, um, you know, it, all sciences are limited what they can observe in the world. Uh, you know, when people were doing astronomy before the telescope, you know, they could only watch where the stars were. And, you know, they watched that the stars were circling around uh, the Earth. Uh, but, you know, when Galileo got a telescope, he could look into Jupiter and find that Jupiter had moons mm -hmm. that were not circling around us, they were circling around mm -hmm. Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So that kind of showed that not everything circles around us, that there are some things that circle around other things. And, and that was feasible not because he had a major theoretical insight, but because he could observe the world at a higher resolution. And now we are developing the capacity to observe the world at a much, much higher resolution than we ever could. So we have all these descriptions of the world where we talk about GDP, where we add up everything that a society produces into a single number. We can observe how much of each one of the things the world makes, what kind of occupations are in exactly which places and so on. We have the capacity to describe the world at a much, much higher resolution, in high definition. We are in the world of big data. Now, you know, uh, people used to do uh, origin and destination mm -hmm. surveys, right. which they would survey people right. to find out right. to plan traffic. Now we have cell phones. We can look at right. where they are in real time and what their movements are. So uh, there is a revolution in how much we can observe in the world. You know, social security systems have the employment history of everybody. Uh, tax systems have the incomes of everybody. So we can now observe reality at a level of resolution that we uh, never could observe before, but our theories are based still on some aggregates. So, so where are we if, if we sort of take a perspective like from Thomas Kuhn, yeah. you know, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Do you think we're on the cusp, uh, potentially, in economics of some sort of Kuhnian Transformation? Well, I, I think we have gone through several and we didn't notice, right? So obviously there was a Kuhnian transformation when they invented the concept of macroeconomics, right? The idea that, that you know, maybe there were some systemic relationships. And that revolution was sort of like undone in the 70s where they said, you know, mm -hmm. you cannot do micro, macroeconomics without micro right. foundations. Right. I think that's in principle a bad idea, that the notion that that you can have macroeconomics, uh, that you need micro foundations to have macroeconomics, and that the mac micro foundations are something they call a representative agent. Right. Never met one. Yeah, never met one, and, and it's obvious that the reason <laughs> the economy is about the heterogeneity of people, not about the similarity of people. That's why they exchange, <laughs> that's why they have in, an incentive to collaborate, and so on. But it's a, sort of like assuming that in order to understand human behavior, you have to understand the the atoms in the cells of the organs that make the human. You know, people don't, you know, people work in departments of corporations in an industry that has other players. So, so the levels of aggregation are, are very complex. And the notion that you are unwilling to accept a systemic uh, properties unless you understand how they are underpinned by individual rationality, you know, it's just un, uh, 
uh, an aesthetic right. requirement of a theory. It's not a, a necessary th um, a scientific requirement of the theory. Yeah. So, but, but we've gone through other things. We, we, we had sort of like atomistic behavior vis-a-vis -vis prices with Walrasian auctioneers. And then we had strategic you know, game theory with very, very few players. Right. Well, there must be something in between where it's a lot messier. We still don't, you know, don't know how to deal with it, but the world must be the something in between, right? right? right. Um, but uh, you know, we've gone through uh, the idea that we're going to derive everything from first principles of human rationality. And now we've made human rationality into a testable Right. area where we can look at to how it is that humans and, behave, how and they we process reject. information. And, and yeah, we reject most of the we time. We reject. So, and, and that means that you know, the whole behavioral economics is now sort of like a nascent revolution in, in economics because a, 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 a economics wanted to define itself. I've never been a fan of this view of economics, but economics it wanted to define itself more uh, around its method than around its questions. Right. So we, uh, we have a method that wants to derive everything we observe about the world on the basis of, say, the idea of human rationality, the idea that people do what they like most among the things they can. That doesn't seem like a very... Yeah, but it's a strong yeah, postulate. Yeah, right? But, um, but uh, if you now say, humans don't behave that way, they behave some other way, well, then you have fundamentally affected uh, you know, a building block that, uh, and this is bound to have uh, very long-term effects on, on the science. So I think that on the behavioral economics side, on the, on the way uh, more complicated things aggregate, and on the ability to look at the world with much higher resolution, that these three things are, going to, are bound to generate uh, a transformation in how we do economics. Uh, and and it, it will eventually happen, uh, but it's somewhat being slowed down by the sociology of the, right, of the, profession. Of the, of the profession. Tell us a little bit about monkeys and trees. Well, it's a, it's a very simple intuition, you know. In, if you ask people, they would tell you that, you know, there's some stuff that is easy to do, and there's some stuff that is really, really hard to do. Some products are relatively simple, and some products are fairly complex. Uh, you know, an Airbus uh, 380 or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it cannot be even made in, in a single company. It has to be made in a very large right. networks of different companies that specialize in many different parts in order to make a single airplane, right? So, so the idea is that modern production is based on integrating human knowledge uh, to a larger extent. Mm -hmm. And then the way I see the process of development is, is the process of expanding productive knowledge in society. So poor societies have very little productive knowledge, a very little division of knowledge among its members, so very s limited scope for a cooperation in firms, so very small firms. And, and the process of development is this process of accumulating knowledge. A, the problem of accumulating knowledge is that it faces a coordination failure. It faces a chicken and egg problem. And the chicken and egg problem is that uh, you, uh, uh, you do not want to become a clockmaker, a watchmaker, in an economy that doesn't make watches. Right. Uh, but you cannot make watches Apropos unless you have watchmakers. Apropos for Geneva. <laughs> and. Even if, so, or, so maybe this watch, this, this company wants to make watches, and there are no watchmakers. So they might want to convince somebody to become a watchmaker. But since there are no watchmakers, right. where, who is he going to learn from? So the problem of development is this process of, of you need more knowledge to make new things, but nobody's making new things because you don't have the knowledge. So the idea is that. Uh, this process, first of all, it's an inefficiency. It's an inefficiency. It slows down the process of development. But to the extent that development happens, it happens by countries moving from the things they know how to do now to things that are nearby, right. nearby in some, some productive capability yeah. space. And what I've tried to do with this monkeys and trees analogy is to is to map out 
the technological relationships between products, the productive knowledge relatedness of products, and to show that effectively in the world, countries tend to move from the things they know how to do to things that are nearby in this productive knowledge sense. So the metaphor was that the product space, the set of possible things you could do is like a forest, forest. where every product is like a tree, and that a, a country is a collection of monkeys that populate certain trees, that, that is, they exploit certain products. And that the process of development is this process of the monkeys colonizing the forest. Right. And the monkeys colonize the forest by moving from where they are to things that are nearby. nearby. We can observe where they are, and if we have the map of the forest, we can see more or less where they're going. And that's how I would describe the process of development from this paradigm. One final question. What would be your advice to a young PhD uh, economist today uh, setting out her or him uh, into our profession? I would, I would take a page from Joseph Campbell who said, follow your bliss and doors will open where you did not know they existed. We are too lucky already, too, too comfortable already uh, to have to get out of bed, out of discipline. We need to get out of bed every morning out of enthusiasm. And so we need to be passionate about the questions we ask ourselves. We have the best job in the world, actually. I, I don't know. I get paid to do something I, I love doing. Exactly. Exactly. Don't tell it too no, hard because no, they might lower our no, wage. No, exactly. <laughs> Ricardo Hausmann, thank you very, very much. It was, a, it was a pleasure talking to you, and we're going to have the pleasure of hearing you speak some more this evening. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for having me.